Praise the Lord, everyone. Thank you for joining us in our continuing series of studies in the life of Jesus. We are at present covering the second set of the parables of Jesus, and this is part four of that set. And the topic today is the wasteful steward or unjust steward, as some of the records put it. Our passage comes from the Gospel of St. Luke. And uh, chapter number 16, and we would like to read the first 13 verses. If you will turn there with me, Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through to 13. And he said also unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man, which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him, that he had wasted his goods. And he called him, and he said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me my stewardship. I cannot dig. To beg I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. And so he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him, and he said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, An hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then said he to another, How much owest thou? And he said, An hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and write fourscore. And the Lord commended the unjust steward, because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, Make yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. As we continue in this second set of parables, we study today and learn from this parable of the unjust steward, who was, in a sense, prodigal, just like the prodigal son. He was wasteful with his master's goods. We find in this parable some rare gems and some precious instructions and exhortations from our Lord Jesus. And these are exhortations to prepare our hearts and to prepare our souls for the eternal future which lays ahead, which we will spend with Him. Praise the Lord. Perhaps of all of the parables, we could say that this one is one that presents the greatest challenge to most Bible students. And this results in various and often erroneous or improbable, at least, interpretations. In fact, in times uh, past, uh, those that were opponents of Christianity attempted to use these very words in this parable to try and spread the misconception and, of course, the error that Jesus was teaching his disciples, us, his people, to be liars or to be dishonest, which, of course, is not at all the aim or the scope of this parable. 
Jesus is teaching all of us, actually, a very important and vital spiritual lesson from this earthly story and underscoring for us the higher degree of wisdom that he really wants us to subscribe to. Jesus begins his parable without a great preamble. He doesn't really offer details. He tells us of a rich man who had left a steward, a manager, if you please, to take care to manage his goods and affairs in his absence. Now, there have been many interpretations, but I think the most logical, the most scriptural, the most literal, and the most consistent with the types that are found in the rest of the scriptures is that this really is a picture of all of mankind. We all have been entrusted with great riches. We all have been left, as it were, by he that owns everything, by the master of all, with riches and provisions that are not our own. We have been given life and those things which we are able, freely able to manage. And how we deal with the things that are committed into our hands, how we do with these things, what we do with them, how we use them, is significant and makes all the difference for our final life's outcome. This parable, in fact, speaks and teaches us of diligence. It teaches us of wisdom. It, it encourages us to industry and generosity and uh, really highlights for us the need to be benefactors to others with all of the things that God so graciously has benefited us and blessed us with. Praise the Lord. We soon learn in this parable that we are accountable. The manager in the Lord's parable had been profligate. He was wasteful with his Lord's goods. The implication here is that he had allowed spoilage, he had allowed loss, and he had, as the manager, misused these goods. Perhaps he had even embezzled for himself. This man who had been entrusted with so much he had freezed away much of his master's wealth and had shown himself to be untrustworthy. Word of this had come to the master, who clearly was well liked in the community and was advised that there was wrongdoing with his manager. And so the Lord came and advised him of his imminent dismissal. It is interesting, and in itself, the difficulty found in this parable, that the main character which the Lord used to highlight these lessons is an unjust and dishonest individual. And yet, in spite of this, there is a, a very appropriate truth depicted in what Jesus is speaking to us. You see, it is here that we understand for every one of us, there comes a time of accountability. Brethren, whether it is in death, which dismisses all of us from this life, or in a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus at his return, we will all be held accountable for what we have done with those things which were so freely, so generously, so liberally afforded to us in this present life. This is, in fact, the first emphasis of this parable. Jesus drives this home. We all will be called to account for our deeds. We will be called in account for our actions, for our choices, and for how we have managed our life here on earth. Brethren, we need to see how that the life Jesus has given us here on earth is a wonderful gift of our loving Father. It is a privilege. It is a benefit and a glorious blessing. And that it comes with many added blessings which are poured into us every single day. Just like that Lord, God has entrusted us with so much. And really, the way that we manage these things is all important. Now, we have the tendency to focus in and feel sorry for ourselves because of the trials and the difficulties and the unpleasantness of life. 
And yes, life may bring some of those things also. But in and of itself, life is the generous provision and endowment of God. Hallelujah. Now, this, of course, is especially true of us who are believers. All true believers have not only been given life here on earth as in a physical existence and a passage in which we can serve God, but God has in the first place afforded us great salvation. Hallelujah. He has made us to belong and brought us into His family. He has called us by His name. He has filled us with His Spirit. And He has given us all the associated benefits that salvation brings, including the glorious, wonderful, and hope-inspiring promise of eternal life. Hallelujah. Surely our Lord has not been a miser with all the goodness and generosity that He shows us. But sadly, like that manager, Sometimes we tend to take for granted the wonderful things that have been entrusted to us. We become slack in our management. We don't use them properly. And time comes when we will become accountable for all that God has given us. But the blessings and honor and directives and provisions of God are not merely the physical blessings of life of which we have plenty. But God has also granted us talents, abilities, strength, and much, much more in this physical realm that once we realize we and truly believe that we are His servants, we should be willing to use and labor with and multiply and utilize in every which way for His glory, to bring Him glory in whichever way. And yet, in spite of His greatness and His goodness to us, we can at times become familiar and, like that man, take for granted the good things of God. And we will find that one day, if we take that bent, if we don't do the best we can, we will be held accountable and responsible for what we did or did not do with what God has committed into our hands. Faithfulness is really the key that is in focus here in this parable at the moment. We are looking at that diligence, that wisdom, that industry that God wants us to demonstrate as His people. Well, if Jesus had ended the parable right here, it would be a brief but very powerful lesson and a reminder that we are responsible and accountable for the things that we do in this life. And this, of course, is very evident and real. All of us in our souls, even those that don't know God, know that there's somehow a day of accountability. And the Bible presents this very vividly in Hebrews 9.27. It tells us this. He says, as it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. There is no such thing as reincarnation. Take two, a second chance This life is all that we have been given as a passage to demonstrate and to give to God what is belonging to Him and to return to Him, not just our souls, which is important, but every effort, every service that we can faithfully provide. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. That record is scribed firmly into the tables of our hearts. Every man knows deep down inside that one day they will give account. If this parable had ended there, I guess that this would be the main lesson and a very powerful one to take home. Please let us remember at all times that we need to remain conscious of that accountability that we have before God. But Jesus takes us a step further to learn a second and just as important lesson. Because, you see, we don't know when we are going to be called to account. And for us, there is no real promise of tomorrow in any of our lives. And so the next emphasis that Jesus faces us with is to challenge our preparation for the eternity ahead. Are we ready? Have we prepared? Have we made every effort that we can to be ready for when He calls us? 
If that was tonight, are you ready? Would we be ready if the Lord's return for you or for me personally takes place right now? Jesus calls for us to be wise stewards, managing wisely, managing correctly and diligently those things that He has given us that we may bring glory and praise to Him, advance the cause of truth, and also make preparation for our eternal destiny. Clearly, the steward in the parable knew that he had been found delinquent. He had, as it were, flushed the income, the benefits, the goods of his Lord down the drain. He had wasted. He had been prodigal. He had been delinquent of his duty. He had been wasteful in his management. And he had been unfaithful in his position, a very privileged, honored position that he had been given. And as a result, his dismissal was inevitable. He had been warned he would lose his position, his place. And so he reasoned uh, to himself that he was really quite unprepared to do anything else in life. That he was really unable to dig for a living, to labor for a living. Maybe he was too lazy to do so. And that he was ashamed to beg for his daily bread. But left without an income, and unlike the benefits that we can claim from governments today, in those days without a job, there was no income. So he resolved to do something different. But let me pause for a moment, brethren, just to comment how it is so vital, so important that we take it to heart that the things that God has given us are precious and they're not to be wasted. They are not to be spent on the wrong things. They certainly are not to be burnt or lost. And like the goods that this man was in charge of, they're certainly not to be frittered away or allowed uh, to spoil. God has imparted these things for us uh, that we may use them uh, to His glory. Hallelujah. We need to realize, brothers and sisters, uh, that Jesus has called us to be His people. And as such, we are not really to be anything else. We are to be His managers. We are to be the sharers of His goodness. We are to be the preachers of His Word. We are to be the ones that are lights in this world, that are salt in this earth. No, another task is not what God wants us to do. It is to serve Him. That is the real and main and primary task that we have been called to. God has not called us to become beggars in this world, certainly, but He has placed us in a position of charge, in a position that is privileged, in a position of honor. In any case, this man, having found himself in this predicament of his own making, of his own doing, soon to be dismissed, soon to lose his position and his income, realizing he was ill-prepared to do anything but what he had been doing potentially for many years, he resolved to do something different, something that might somehow be of help to him in his condition. And whilst uh, in itself this was a dishonest thing to do, it was also a shrewd solution that would secure his future. This man called his Lord's debtors and then began to favor each one with a special discount. This is uh, his words. He said, I'm resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. And so he called every one of his Lord's debtors, and he said unto the first, How much do you owe my Lord? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said, Quickly, sit down, take your bill, and jot down, and, and scratch that out, and write fifty. This man got a fifty percent discount. And of course, he was not aware that the steward had just been sacked. He would have assumed that this benefit, this, this discount, 
had come from the Lord himself, from the master himself. And to another, he gave a similar discount, taking the bill and quickly writing. Notice he did it quickly because his time was coming to an end. He had to give the books, the accounts uh, to his master who had called him to account. To each of them, he gave a, a hefty discount of what they owed, reducing their debt and at the same time ingratiating himself, making himself looking good, frankly, to them in the hope in the hope that once he was destitute, alone, and uh, with nothing, uh, without an income, that they might take notice of him and take care of him, repaying, if you please, the favor uh, that he had shown them. He was, in his own way, safeguarding his future. Our Lord is demonstrating that in the world there is a certain level of wisdom. Notice what this man did. By offering these favors, essentially he made these individuals his own debtors, whilst at the same time they would have rejoiced over the master's generosity and spread word of his kindness. If you could find the spiritual application here for a moment, brethren, we are to spread the goodness of God in the right manner, not to be liked of men per se, but just so that we can glorify God and cause other men to recognize and to appreciate and to accept the goodness of God. Now, his actions would have presented as a positive result to the master, even if in reality, the accounting books the manager presented him were in fact cooked. The master's response to the manager's shrewd move was actually very interesting as it was surprising. We read in verse 8, And the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. Please notice, he didn't commend him on his dishonesty, but because he had done wisely. And this is the aspect of the lesson that Jesus wants us to take home here. Without necessarily respecting or always being able to genuinely admire their motivations, we may consider sometimes certain individuals in our society, individuals who are wealthy, who choose to become philanthropists, individuals who donate large sums of money to worthwhile causes to take care of those that are less privileged, as it were. And at face value, in a worldly sense, this is a charitable thing to do. It's a giving work. It is an aspect of love, if you please. Let me stress here that unless we love God first, loving others is only part of the commandment. It is actually the secondary commandment. It is by far better to love God first and do His will, and certainly necessary to love others. But these individuals don't know God, and yet, and yet, they demonstrate a certain wisdom, if you please, a certain, a certain shrewdness in that by giving, they actually receive. You see, this form of philanthropy often earns them attention, respect. It earns exposure in the community. Their names go up in the papers. The news report the events. Their motivation it may not be a holy one, but certainly their method is sound. Because in giving, they receive. Now, by this parable, Jesus is not commending dishonesty. And he's not teaching us to do dishonestly. And neither is he teaching us to seek after the attention of men. But rather, Jesus is highlighting the necessity of wisdom. He is comparing the wisdom of the world, which is readily seen in these actions and actions like them, with the higher and spiritual wisdom that we as his children ought to have. Now, in the parable, you will notice the Lord of the steward did not berate him. The man didn't call him down. He did not focus on his manager's dishonesty. He achieved a goal. He achieved a shrewd result. It was an interesting and beneficial result 
And so he commended the wasteful servant, the unjust steward, for having acted, although in a worldly way, if you please, but wisely. Wisely. You see, this man, in the little time he had left, in the notice period, if you please, he had utilized the management of the goods that had been entrusted to him in a wise manner. And by wise benevolence, by being thoughtful of others and benefiting others, he had won good favor with those debtors, both for his Lord and really had provided a simple but effective solution for his own future. It is here, at this point, that Jesus drives home to us the truth and the necessity that we must be wise in our preparation for the future. We don't have much time. Even as a young person, you have no guarantee of tomorrow. Accountability could be the next thing that you face. And so the necessity for preparation, the readiness to face accountability is all important. And Jesus is saying we must be wise. He points to those who, like the steward, are of the world in a worldly sense. And he shows that in their dealings, in their choices, at a worldly level, nothing to do with spiritual things, they are often more skillful. They are often more determined and industrious in preparing for themselves the temporal and perishable things of this life's future. And they do so much better often than the children of light. Those that are saved must be every bit as diligent, must be every bit as wise to prepare for the spiritual necessities of their eternal future. Hallelujah. It is evident all around us that those interested, caught up in the trap of this temporary, worldly life will often cooperate one with another. They will deal, they will plan, and they will labor quite hard and long, often even unlawfully to procure for themselves a more secure, a more comfortable, a more prosperous future in this present life. And if you are honest, we can say uh, with the Apostle, and such were some of us. Do you remember what it was like before Jesus came into your life? Do you remember the, the energy consumed and the drive and the efforts made in trying to get someplace and, and make ends meet? But more than that, to try and achieve a position, a goal in this life that was worthwhile. Uh, chasing that rainbow and never quite getting there. But making every effort, laboring, and often doing so even in a uh, dishonest manner, just simply so we could get ahead. And yet, when we, those same people, now are redeemed and changed and saved and have come to this great knowledge of truth and profess an eternal hope beyond this material world, often we can be guilty of slackness. We can be guilty of laboring by far less, by being less diligent and less applied at attaining the glorious and everlasting rewards which are prepared and waiting, promised for those that are faithful. Oh, saints of God, we must be careful not to be ever become enmeshed and lost in the struggle and endeavors of this earthly life to the detriment, to the loss of sight of what really matters to us as believers and of all the wonderful things that God has in our eternal a reward. Now, Jesus said we need to be wiser. And he points to the shrewd steward, who although was doing dishonestly, he was wise enough to prepare for his future. He knew it was soon coming uh, to an end. Oh, brethren, we have no guarantee of tomorrow. What if our life comes to an end? Have we prepared? Are we ready? Have we been wise? In verse 9, Jesus says something uh, which has rattled uh, many uh, that read uh, the Scriptures. He says, And I say unto you, 
make of yourselves friends of mammon of unrighteousness that when ye fail they may receive you into everlasting habitations and uh, this uh, word and this verse has been the consternation of uh, many who are believers you see clearly our primary preparation is that of storing all kinds of wonderful spiritual treasures in heaven jesus said that that is where our hearts must be with treasures in heaven not here on earth and this is done by attentive diligent building of a strong consistent and intimate relationship with jesus how do we do this well we apply ourselves to prayer to the study of his word and the righteous observance of all that he commands we need to maintain that first and foremost but jesus here then issues some solemn advice and he adds another dimension to the preparation that even we as christians as believers ought to apply ourselves to you see for each of us have been given and we are possessors if you please of various degrees of earthly wealth earthly talents if you will like in this temporal life god has given to us just as much as he has to someone else and being in the lord does not lessen the importance of what god has given us even at a physical level note that many of god's greatest servants were also very talented men or very wealthy men observe the skills of david as he plays wonderful hymns on his harp as he sings praises and psalms unto god look at the mighty sword in his hand as he goes in the name of jesus to conquer against his enemies take a look at abraham and the wealth that the man had and yet he was classed a friend of god the examples could be multiplied many fold there were and there are many wealthy people amongst the servants of the living god blessed by god with both spiritual and temporal blessing you see it's not the money per se but the love of money the scripture says which is the root of all evil and so we need to remember that god has given us these things for a purpose and it's not merely the money what about your talent what about your abilities what about your special skill set what about the opportunities that you have that someone else may may not in essence you have been given a repertoire can i say a chest full as it were of treasures from god and these are all given for a very good reason god just like that rich man made you a manager a steward of his goods and his message essentially is something like this you are likely soon and without notice to have to give up all i repeat all your worldly possessions you see we cannot take any of these things with us he might be saying to you and i beware lest the riches of this life the things that i have blessed you with the things that are meant to be a help to you and assistance to you a blessing in your life harden your heart and you do not see the needs of others this is one of the dangers that we have that we are so comfortable we are so well off we are so well catered for and uh, that we have all that we need and so much more that we fail to comprehend that others do not have and i don't mean just physically now or financially jesus is saying to you and i in these words do what the manager in my parable did for the people in his world but do this in the people in your present world in your society while you still can what was the wise move what was the shrewd move that man found a way of making the master someone of a benefactor in these people's eyes they ordered debt and he made their debt lighter 
Brethren, you and I have a means, a way of showing a path to salvation. Hallelujah. God has given to you, to me, the keys, as it were, to open the doors of salvation for so many. What you have in your hand, in your heart, in your soul is a glorious, wonderful, present gift of God. And it isn't just for you. It is to be shared. It is to be given to others, to lessen their debt, to help them to come to salvation also. Do what the manager did. Do it while you still can. Benefit them. Benefit others with the things that you have because they have been given to you. They're not yours. They've been given to you. Be generous. Share my riches, says Jesus. Forgive the debt of those who owe. The word of Jesus speaks to your heart and mind as he communicates these truths. He says, help the poor. Open the doors for those who are destitute. Give of all that was given to you freely, both spiritually and physically. Freely you have received. Freely give. And all of this advice, this beautiful message is encapsulated in this verse that we just read. I say to you, make yourself friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. Now, some have interpreted this to mean that we ought to be friendly with the world, meaning that we ought to be right there in worldly ways of unrighteousness. That's not what it's teaching us. But rather that the mammon of unrighteousness, which is the money of this world, the prosperity of this world, should be something that we are neither so attracted to that that's all we want at the detriment of our relationship with God, but neither should we shun it altogether as if it's not for you and I, because there is a way to use it correctly. Jesus encourages you and I, in other words, to become conversant, friendly enough with the mammon of our righteousness that is the financial prosperity of this world, but not so that we can draw personal merit, not so that we can make it the satisfaction of our lives, not so that we could gain commendation to ourselves and the attraction of accolades of men. He doesn't tell us to do this so that we can lose ourselves into the empty and futile pursuit of the riches and and wealth of this world because he teaches us elsewhere these things will pass away. Notice, we are likely to have to give them up at a moment's notice. But rather, so that whatever God has provided for us, both physically and spiritually, may be used. Please notice, used. Not be our master, but may be used in our service to our Lord and Master, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. In other words, we are to be a blessing to others. We are to alleviate burdens and suffering. Why? What is the emphasis of this? What is Jesus really saying? Well, you see, he says, when you fail. When you fail. He doesn't say if you fail, but when you fail. In other words, when your sun sets. When your journey has come to an end and is over. When finally we fail in the sense that death has knocked on our door. And we are laid to rest that we may joyfully be received into our reward, into eternal dwellings, habitations in heaven by those who have gone before, by those who were benefited from our influence, by those with whom we shared the goodness of God, by those who perhaps were in some way or another affected by our lives and our testimony for Jesus. And we have to use what we have, and it includes not just our voices, not just our actions, but the things that we have to reach those others. Jesus will be the first one to receive us in such habitations. You see, He was our example, but there will be also some poorer saints, perhaps, faithful souls who might have been blessed 
and helped during our lifetime by the very things that we did. And there will be angels in heaven rejoicing who have witnessed our passage and journey here on earth. And they too will be welcoming. These habitations, eternal habitations that verse 9 speaks of, are not the habitations of the unrighteous. These are the habitations of heaven. Eternal habitations into which we joyfully will be received when we have done wisely, correctly, if you please, shrewdly, with all that God has given us. There's another beautiful verse that comes to mind. And Jesus says this, he says, to be harmless as doves, wise as serpents. And this is in doing his work. He that winneth a soul is wise. There is a wisdom associated with working for God, uh, which is praised uh, by the Lord. Hallelujah. We are on a journey. And we're all traveling. And whether you like to see it that way or not, we are traveling. The things that you accrue, the things that you accumulate, aren't here to stay. They're not coming with you. Jesus shows there is perfectly good reason to utilize what we have in this world to do honor to God and to the good of our brethren. And to do so without reservation, with all-hearted generosity, remembering that we are only the managers of what really belongs to God anyhow. Oh, brother and sister, at what point do we become the owners of the money that's in our bank account? At what point do we think we really are the proprietors of anything here on earth? Because this is how it works. The moment we pass from this life, we leave it all behind. Someone else gets it. And so, unless we have used both what we have inwardly and spiritually from God for His purposes, and what we have outwardly and physically for His glory and to be a blessing to others, these things will pass away. We sing a beautiful old hymn, a song. The things that I love and hold dear to my heart They're just borrowed. They are not mine at all. Jesus only lets me use them to brighten my life. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, we need a reminder, saints. We are not citizens of this world. We are pilgrims passing through this world. We are citizens of a heavenly city, of a heavenly country. We are traveling through. And whilst we are so blessed with so much here on earth, we must be certain not to hold on too tightly to anything that is physical, anything that is financial, anything that could hold us here for when Jesus calls us, when he comes for us, personally through our death or when he returns and takes us home we cannot have for to have anything that weighs us down or that holds us to this dying world paul writing to timothy said these precious words he advised timothy to charge them that are rich in this world oh now listen You may not consider yourself a rich person, but I guarantee that if we were to compare our lifestyles, what we have in our day-to-day life, to many, many people in this world, we would be considered wealthy indeed. And I am sure that in the days that these scriptures were written, if we could somehow equate to those times, we would be indeed very wealthy. Most of us have more clothes than we could possibly wear. Most of us do not travel on foot like they used to. We have chariots uh, called vehicles and cars and some of us multiple such things. Many of us have enough money not merely to buy the next meal, but to provide for our needs and that of our families many, many, many days to come. And go on and on. You could make a very long list of the many blessings. And so these scriptures apply to you and I. Charge them, remind them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded. Firstly, we are to be humble about the things that God has put into our lives and given us so freely. 
reminding ourselves that we don't own these things. Oh, we'd love to be bosses and proprietors, but we own nothing. Our very life, our very soul belongs to God. Our very breath is given daily by a faithful Savior who created us. He says, charge them, charge them that they be not high-minded, stay humble in spite of the things God has given you. Don't allow them to become obstacles and not to trust in uncertain riches. Hallelujah. Has God supplied you with things? Praise God. Wonderful. But use them. Use them to the glory of God. Don't put your heart in those things. Put your heart in the giver, not in the gift. Hallelujah. Bless the giver and rejoice in the gift, but use that gift for His glory. Not to put their trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. Oh, in what God? The living God. The one and only true Savior. The one that lives and has lived forever. The one with whom is immortality. He is the God we serve. He is the one that gives riches and all things, notice, to enjoy. Hallelujah. He, the living God, gives to us richly all things to enjoy. God in His goodness has blessed us that we may enjoy these things. Oh, but there is a responsibility that comes with what God gives us. Please notice, He goes on to say that they do good. That they be rich in a different way, in good works. That they be ready to distribute. It's still talking about those that are rich in this world, you and I. We who have been given so much that we do good things with it. Not pile it up, not waste it, not be prodigal with it, but bring God glory. Not take it for our own and only our own benefit, but to be a blessing to others. That they be rich in good works. God made you rich spiritually and He has given you much more to be able to distribute and to share, willing to communicate. And that's not just talking, by the way. To communicate there means literally to share and to give out to others. Now there is a storage here implied in the last verse that you're seeing on your screen. Laying up in store for themselves. Can you see the preparation? Can you see the preparation, the wisdom in preparing? How do we prepare? By stocking up goods? No. You can see the little cartoon there. He's trying to take all of his goods and wealth into heaven. They won't get in. You've got to leave it all behind. But there is a way of laying up store and treasure in heaven. Hallelujah. And a good foundation against the time to come so that we may hold on to eternal life. And that is to do God's will, God's way. Hallelujah. That's what the scripture is saying to you and I. To be wise in the same manner that the steward were wise, was wise even though he was doing dishonestly, being a man of the world. God doesn't want us to do dishonestly, but in an honest manner, in a right manner, in a righteous manner, laying up treasures in heaven. Things that will last forever. Jesus said it this way. Where moth does not eat, and where thieves cannot break through and steal, and where rust doesn't break down. Hallelujah. Lay hold on eternal life. Prepare for it. Be wise. Be ready. Because our time of accountability comes. And I can hear the noises in the news every day. We are coming closer and closer to the ending of the age. To all the things that God has prophesied by His Spirit in His Word. And uh, it won't be long. Accountability is coming. We must open up the books to show what we did with what God gave us. Here's the key word of all of this. We must be faithful. Hallelujah. If you read at verse 10 through to 13, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. Jesus emphasizes His instruction to us. He exhorts us to greater and higher purposes. He says, lift up your eyes. I gave you all these things, not just so you can enjoy them here on earth and think of nothing else and have no care for anyone else. 
He wants us to lift our eyes higher and see the purpose for which not only He died for us to save us, but endows us with great gifts so that we may share with others. He tells us that if we have not shown faithfulness, care, and wisdom with the earthly, the temporal things, you might call them unrighteous mammon, the stuff that passes away, the things that will not last, the things that we spend so much time and energy and mind and heart and very soul to gain. Brethren, if we're not faithful with those things that He has provided for us, why should we be trusted with that which is eternal? How can we be given the heavenly and spiritual riches which He has in store for us? The message of Jesus is clear. Those that are faithful in little will be made faithful in much. Those that overcome the temptation of this world use what they've been given for the right things in the right manner with the right spirit motivation for the right reasons will be rewarded with much more than they could ever have given. You cannot outgive God. You cannot overtake the goodness and faithfulness and generosity of God. Clearly, the greater riches are not of this unrighteous world. They are not of unrighteous mammon. They are not found in this worldly system. Our passage here on earth is a documentation. It is, as it were, an evidence written in heaven. It is a proof of our faithful in what God calls little, so that we may be given much greater in heaven. Hallelujah. He that overcometh, to him will I give. God is such a giver. Hallelujah. He gave us life to begin with. He gave us salvation and He gave us all the provisions that come with that. All the wonderful gifts we enjoy. We, we are blessed, but they are not merely for us. They are for us to do His will. We need to be wise, wise stewards, wise managers of all that God has given us. All we have, all I have, all you have, everything we have is he is. And wise management of what He has given us will demonstrate our capacity for handling what He still wants to give us in part and endow us as our own. Listen, if we can't handle what He has given us of His now and do right with it, why would He give us our own eternal reward? All that He has given us here on earth is temporal. It will pass. It will not last. It's borrowed. It's not mine at all. And yet, God promises to impart to those that are faithful, those that have overcome, things that are eternally theirs. Listen, when we get to heaven, hallelujah, that eternal life is ours for good, eternally. The streets of gold are there for us for good, eternally. We will not die and we will not become sick. Never again will we have a need of any kind because we will be with Jesus forever. That is our reward. But why would God give to us what is ours and prepared for us if we were not faithful with what He lent us and what we borrowed from Him during this life on earth? This passage here on earth is a document is an evidence, is a documentation, it is a proof of our faithfulness to God. Hallelujah. The things of this world, saints of God, we cannot hold on to, but the eternal riches of heaven are forever ours to have and to hold in Jesus. It is found in the choices we make with what God has so kindly lent to us that we demonstrate our allegiance uh, to Him. Have a look at verse 13. Jesus said these words. He says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will love one and hate the other. No man can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now notice earlier He told you to become friendly, accustomed wise with mammon of unrighteousness. 
In other words, we are not to evade or avoid those things that are around us, but we need to learn how to use them. But then let's remember this. We are never to become the servant of mammon. We must be the servant of the living God. We cannot be for the world and its riches and for God at the same time. It cannot be. The things that we have, the things of this world, the things that God has provided for us must not be our masters. They must not rule us. They must not control us. But rather they must be our servants. Hallelujah. They must be something that we use as tools in our service to the King of Kings. No one can serve two masters. And yes, even as Christians, we have a choice to make because daily we are faced with the temptation. We are faced with that choice. What are we going to serve? Who will we be the servants of today? Well, let us shout with a resounding chorus in one voice, in one mind and one accord. Take this whole world, but give me Jesus. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless you as you consider these thoughts in prayer and before God. Amen.